my raw impressions are that each one of these target sites is like a different spoke in a wheel. It's like a, diff a different part of a jigsaw puzzle. And each one is dormant. It does nothing unless it's commanded to do something. Mm -hmm. And then all it does is, is transfer or it, it just transfers something. But it's an integral part of this whole cobweb of jigsaw puzzle. I get a just an overwhelming feeling of the, the big three C, you know, command, control, and communications. If you equate this to a cobweb, every single angle in a cobweb represents a location on the cobweb. And I get an impression that the spider has not turned his whole cobweb on yet. Also, there's more than just these four locations. I have uh, an immediate vision of seabed locations. You know, I, I honestly believe that there are seabed locations of these, these things. We cover strange declassified files. Subscribe to join us. That was Joseph McMonagall. In the 1980s, he was one of the U.S. Army's elite remote viewers, with the program when it was codenamed Grill Flame. The sessions you heard were part of Project 8200, a secret effort between 1982 and 86 that attempted to corroborate information from Pat Price, an extremely talented viewer. CIA Director Stansfield Turner was even quoted once saying Price could see what was going on anywhere in the world through his psychic powers. Price's personal sessions led him to believe this. At least four mountains across Earth hide secret underground bases, managed by beings he believed were extraterrestrial. In 1973, two years before his death, Price gave Hal Putoff at the DIA-funded SRI International, a file, only saying, you might be interested in these UFO bases. Their locations were important, he claimed, one under Mount Hayes, Alaska, others beneath Mount Perdido, Spain, Mount Zeal, Australia, and Mount Inyangani, Zimbabwe. The site under Mount Perdido had craft, Price claimed, generated their own electromagnetic fields. For seven years, these claims sat unchecked. Until 1980, when Putoff gave the file to Stargate head Skip Atwater. Soon after, Project 8200 was born. A presentation from Atwater in 2009 explains. He first gave the locations, only the coordinates, no details of what Price saw, to McMonagall. In July and August of 82, they held several sessions using a technique known as extended remote viewing, a meditative style where the viewer teeters between asleep and awake. McMonagall corroborated subterranean facilities at each location. He begins by talking about the purpose of the Mount Hay site. It's a uh, defensive, not offensive, like a shield of some kind. Very high, high charged, very excited, coherent pulses of positive charged particles. It's never been used on a uh, full output still. Like still or experimental. The power, uh, the power is weird. Uh, it's like, uh, I don't think it's ever been done. He goes on to observe the Hayes location carried out long-range, low-frequency communications of some kind. A side effect of this was damage to electronic systems of overhead aircraft. Four years after he said those words, Japan Airlines Flight 1628 witnessed two UFOs that emitted heat and were flanked by a flying disc. The encounter occurred in a near-perfect bubble around Mount Hayes, Alaska, starting 150 miles to the north and ending 150 miles southwest. Atwater and McMonagall checked out the rest of Price's claims, too. On Mount Zeal, Australia, he said this. 
sense feeling of control protection and waiting very little activity very few people it's a caretaker type keep flashing the protective umbrella it's like an instantaneous umbrella small uh, small nuclear power device uh, feeling for caretaker national something national force that I get uh, all this overlay of uh, command and control centers like defensive command control centers it's like we're talking concept because this is all waiting just waiting McMonagle stresses this reminds him of command centers he's been in before. Four years later, another veteran of the unit, Mel Riley, viewed something similar. He compared the Alaska location to NORAD at Cheyenne Mountain, built into a cave system. He saw a dark, shadowy entity sitting at a keyboard with a monitor. Back to 82, McMonagle concluded his viewing of Zeal with this. I have a very sinister feeling for this target, and, you know, it's like the old Darth Vader feeling, and I don't know how to explain it, that. In one way, you say it's not, uh, it doesn't threaten anything, it seems to be defensive. In I nature, know, but, but it's a sinister feeling about it. It's not threatening now, but it's sort of like putting a snake in a box. You know he's in the box, <laughs> but he's not threatening you. Okay. That kind of a feeling. The remaining sites in Spain and Zimbabwe are analyzed next. In the Mount Perdido session, McMonagall notices something. The sites appear connected in a sort of relay. He also suggests there may be human activity here. Constructed elsewhere and flown in. See it being in place by a handful of people. Helicopters. It's a very rugged mountain range. Kind of desolate. Vehicles of transport are perceptible. It's helicopters. Not large, but small. That's all we got. Boxes being brought in by helicopters. He also makes the odd distinction of seeing sheep near the mountain. Remarkably, Atwater confirmed this when he visited Perdido two decades later. And more strangely, he even snapped this photo, which seems to show an object in the sky above the peak. By the final session on Mount Inyangani, McMonagall put all the pieces together and suggests the locations are linked with an object in deep space. All black boxes, electronics, power pack, all suitcase size, sealed, very advanced, like uh, i never seen before, complex. Get a uh, feeling of sensing and receiving and emitting uh, relay and concept of uh, control, command control. Uh, uh, location is an uh, integral part of uh, location. Get a fixed, uh, fixed orbitable platform. It's not going anywhere. It's relaying something away from Earth, he says. No, no occupants now, but there's a capability, it seems. I can't tell if it's Occupiable there or occupied before delivery. It's fully automated. No occupants, fully automated. Atwater then asks him to describe the origin of the deep space platform. 
origin of bead is perceptible? Huh. It's all blank. I don't get anything. Get what looks like a reddish yellow ball, black spots. I understand that. Or it's far away feeling. I feel like uh, don't feel like I can go on a straight line there. Like I'm folded over. Just got a memory. Got a memory. Yeah. Some vague familiarity. After the session, he explains more. I got a. In trying to go to the origin of the spaceborne platform, I got a very old and a very new sensation. Like, like I got both sensations. I, I have, I'm having a lot of trouble with time on this thing. It's like uh, periods of time I'm talking about. I'm trying to equate the years, and they're they're not. There's like I'm going from ancient to new to ultra modern back to new. You know, I'm flopping around in time, so that that's probably pretty important. This uh, space-borne platform is in is in a permanent fixed place. It's not rotating around the Earth, and it's not uh, moving north and south or doing any orthotagonal rotation or anything. It's fixed. It's just like it's nailed in space, and as the Earth rotates, it rotates with the Earth. It's like it's fastened with a string to the Earth, never moves, and it's way out there, you know, so it has no decaying orbit. It's fixed. I felt like I was really with the target, and I felt like I went a long, long way off somewhere. And I had a feeling that uh, in trying to go to the origin of the platform, I had a feeling like I couldn't go in a straight line to it, like I had to deviate in some way, and then I felt like I got convoluted inside out and all these other things. And so it's just a lot of weird experience with this. What yeah. does it? What emotion does the session evoke? When I well, I have to compare it to something. And comparably speaking, when I first started this series of four targetings, my initial target, or target number one, is I had a very sinister feeling. Target number two got less sinister. Target number three was not sinister at all. This target has convinced me that this has no absolutely no evil content in the way that we would describe evil, you know, like guiding nuclear weapons or blasting space platforms out of space or any of that stuff. There's just no sinister attitude to this. To this one particular one? To all of them. All right. and, I, and there are a lot more of these target sites. This is a lot to take in. Replay it if you need to. In 2009, Atwater explained other viewers saw bases beneath the four mountains in 85 and 86 too. The results were generally the same. One described thin, unemotional, cold, programmed people worked at the Alaska location. They were strange and had a mission. But what do you think? Does the McMonagle data verify Price's claims that ETs built bases underground? And could they really communicate with an object in deep space without astronomers noticing? There are other questions too. Like, how many bases are there if they exist? And what purpose could a deep space platform have to continually triangulate data from Earth? Also, who could the helicopters and people have been at Mount Perdido? And maybe the strangest question, does McMonagall's description of the object's origin suggest it may be interdimensional? Atwater says these results were never officially reported to higher-ups. And we understand why. The stigma of UFOs was probably too much of a risk for Stargate's funding, which was already researching paranormal abilities. But the enormity of what Project 8200 suggests, a global subterranean relay system built to be hidden with technology that's advanced yet ancient, is staggering. Let us know what you think in the comments and share this with everyone you can. It's information that, for whatever reason, 
isn't widely available online, but is supported by declassified documents and public interviews. Thank you to all our Patreon supporters, including Matthew J. If you like what we do, consider joining them on Patreon and help us produce one new episode every week. See you next time.